Father, thanks for joining us again. My pleasure, Andrew. I'm doing great. Swinging on a star. Good. Great. Fantastic. Great to hear. Uh, today we're talking about being single. Um, not anything that you or I are currently having any experience with. Hmm. Uh, have our... Anyway. <laughs> Everyone has some experience with it at some point. <laughs> at some point, yeah. Well, we... We wanted to do an extra. This wasn't in the original plan, Father, to talk about, have a whole episode on the single life, but um, we were getting some comments on YouTube channel and podcasts. There's been a lot of discussion also in some other forums about how the single life is somehow less superior to other forms of life or that it's not really a valid quote unquote vocation or state in life. So you and I were chatting after mass one Sunday and decided we should do an extra episode on this. So uh, where would you like to start on, on this episode, Father? Well, I think just to sort of give the, the, the source of the problem, perhaps, and this, this misunderstanding sure. that, that somehow the, the single life isn't, you know, not even that it's inferior, but there, I, I have heard people who have come to me, you know, Father, uh, someone told me that, you know, that the single life isn't a thing that I, I, you know, I've been living single and I'm in my forties. Do I have to get married? And I think that that idea probably well-meaning on the part of whoever it was that, that told this person that, um, and I have heard it more than once is that there are, you know, as we said, there are three states of life, the, the priest of the religious life marriage. And we call them states of life because once they've been entered definitively, then they cannot simply be given up. You can't just decide, well, I'm, I'm sick of being married. I'm going to go off and become a religious or vice versa. Uh, so we don't include the condition of being single in the world among the states of life because it, it need not be a, a permanent condition uh, for, for various reasons. And, and uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about more about that. Uh, and that's, led some people to think that, that that means that there's some, it's not included in the states of life. So there's something wrong. If you're single, that's mm-hmm. a problem that you need to resolve. And mm-hmm. that's not the case. Sure. Sure. So, so you're saying when, when the church or when you and I are talking about these three states in life and we're not including single life, it's because, well, there's a reason. And I guess we'll get into that. Um, but it doesn't mean that single life is, is a bad thing at all. Right. It does not mean that, that you're somehow opposing the will of God by remaining single in the world. Okay. All right. There are lots of different reasons why someone could be single. Either they're young or, you know, all, all sorts of other, uh, scenarios can, is there a difference? Do we need to talk about each of these states and not states in life, each of these, uh, situations differently when we're talking about different, uh, single life people I'm not describing that well, but you know what I mean? <laughs> right. So there's, uh, there's definitely overlap, but uh, we can roughly divide them into three categories of you know, single okay. people. One, we might be the, the sort of person who's remaining single simply to avoid having the responsibilities of, uh, of marriage or consecrated life. So don't want to be, don't want to be tied down. I uh, want to be a free spirit, do my own thing, go where I want, spend as much time with my friends as I want and my hobbies as I want uh, to spend my money and uh, amusing myself and not have to worry about uh, caring for a family. Uh, likewise, not wanting the obligations of, of consecrated life, that restriction of, of, uh, of movement. And this sort of single life is kind of a problem. Uh, certainly if it goes on, for an extended period of time, it's definitely a problem. It's it's just selfish. Right? One could give oneself to something worthwhile, but one prefers to to be free to to play. Uh, okay, it's an indication of immaturity, you know. And you you have this with plenty of you know young people in, in who you know just out of high school or college who are kind of spreading their wings a bit, but before too too long, they they get a bit more serious and and enter into a state of life. Um, but someone who, who finds himself in this sort of situation should really think about what his life is for the whole purpose of his existence, mm-hmm. get things in order and, and choose to do something really worthwhile, uh, with himself. If, if you had a, if you had a young adult that you were counseling or maybe someone in, in your parish who was 
22, 23, graduated college and just has no interest in religious life or marriage and is just kind of doing this, would you counsel him to kind of grow up and get serious? Or would you say, eh, you know, at that age, it's kind of okay. Give it a few more years. What do you think? Yes. And we'll say more about that later on too. But to, you know, that there is some degree of that is fine, but they should still be doing something worthwhile. Not just, okay. you know, not even to just say, I'm going to spend the next five years just having a good time. That that doesn't help them at all towards developing themselves to to live in a particular state of life um, or to develop their their virtue, develop their relationship with God. That's just wasted time at best and at worst, uh, you know, the plenty of occasions of, of serious sin. Sure. All right. So what's the second category of single single people? The, the second category are the, the involuntary singles, uh, those who want to get married but have been unable to find a, a suitable spouse. And this is by far your, your largest group of single people. And you, know, you could include that those who are young, plan to get married, probably will before too long. Um, it's a subset we don't really need to consider because their con- condition is, is temporary. Uh, there are others who have spent years being, being disappointed. And may even be unlikely to to, to ever get married. Uh, that doesn't mean that they. It's impossible to find someone. I have a. Uh, sure. My sister often used to quote her her friend's grandmother, who said, uh, "For every moldy piece of cheese, there's a crusty piece of bread." And <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, there are eight billion people in the world. Surely, someone in you know in this situation. All right, I'm 35. Have many money. I could find someone who will marry me, especially if I start using the the internet and you know, singles websites and dating apps and so on. But sh- should you? That I mean, that would be yeah. the question, right? Do we reach a certain age and and lower the standard? All right, 35 now. Anyone will do. Um, and that's that was particularly a question for for women too, because they're they're prospects of marriage decrease more uh, as they age than that a man's does proportionately. Um, and the answer to whether or not they should lower their standards is absolutely not. You know, don't. Um, and, you know, Pius XI in, in Cassidy Canubi writing about, about marriage says, to the proximate preparation of a good married life belongs very especially the care in choosing a partner. On that depends a great deal whether the forthcoming marriage will be happy or not, since one may be to the other either a great help in leading a Christian life or a great danger and hindrance. And so that they may not deplore for the rest of their lives the sorrows arising from an indiscreet marriage, those about to enter into wedlock should carefully deliberate in choosing the person with whom henceforward they must live continually. They should, in so deliberating, keep before their minds the thought first of God and the true religion of Christ, then of themselves, of their partner, of the children to come, as also of human and civil society, for which wedlock is a fountainhead. So that's a lot there. Uh, but he's, he's saying, keep your standards high. A lot depends on this. So mm-hmm. first think about the church and religion um, and God, then all right, about the good of yourself, about the good of the other person, about the children you may have. Think about human and civil society for crying out loud. Don't lower your standards. <laughs> uh, these right. are I- important things. Um, and so it, you know, and it's just common sense, really. A, a bad marriage is is an obstacle to to legitimate happiness and can easily become an obstacle to salvation. There's there's no commandment to to get married. Nobody has to get married. Nobody. Um, well, I guess you could think of some situation where somebody did, but in general, right? Uh, you know, uh, and no one can be forced into marriage against his will. Right? Desperation and a false sense of urgency. Are, are bad guy, guides in making important decisions. So you don't want to get into that, that desperate, all right, well, time to lower the standards. You know, pretty much anybody who's willing is, uh, is okay. Um, right. And one can continue, you know, as long as one lives, one can and is, is validly able to contract a marriage, one can have the hope that eventually he'll meet someone. Right. Sure. And, and if the right person eventually comes along, hey, great, go right ahead and, and get married. Uh, but we really, it's important not to create, uh, out of nothing, an obligation that to, to get married that, uh, that, you know, that can cause a crisis of conscience and may even endanger someone's salvation, um, because of our, our misguided ideas about, 
uh, states of life and, and the will of God in this matter. So to remain in that condition involuntarily with the hope of one day getting married, not a problem. You can uh, go on like that for a long time. And it's not as if, you know, you're somehow cursed by God or, or offending him or, or, or the like, but definitely right. can't emphasize it enough. Keep that, that high standard, choose someone who's going to be a help to, uh, to your salvation and not a hindrance. We talked about this a little bit on the episode we did on marriage itself. And you and I both discussed, this is probably the most important decision that you're going to make in your life. Don't rush into it. Don't let emotions play into it. This is a very practical, important decision for your salvation right. and the salvation of someone else too. Right. And, you know, and possibly, you know, more people as you have children, Right, you know, all of yeah. that, all that has to be a consideration. Right. All right. So that's the second category of people who are single. What about the third and final? Which would be those who, who choose single life in the world as a permanent condition that they're making that, that voluntary act to embrace this as their condition of life. We won't say state of life because we said it's not that. <laughs> Um, and usually that, that does include binding themselves by, by vows of, uh, perpetual and perfect, uh, chastity. Um, and there is of course, something analogous to, to religious life there because of that vow, um, giving some stability to that, that single condition. Um, but it is, they are still free to, to enter a religious congregation at some later date, should they decide to do that, even if they have taken a, a private vow of, of, uh, of perfect chastity. Okay. Um, but this is this to, to do this is an entirely legitimate choice to, to live, decide to, to, to consecrate yourself to God, um, living in the, uh, in the state of, of celibacy in, in the world. Um, and the, the, the state of consecrated chastity is objectively superior to the married state. So Pius XII says he, he has a beautiful encyclical um, on sacred virginity, sacra virginitas. And he says in there, this, this doctrine of the excellence of virginity and of celibacy and of their superiority over the married state was revealed by our divine redeemer and by the apostle of the Gentiles, St. Paul. So too, it was solemnly defined as a dogma of divine faith by the Holy Council of Trent. And so when our Lord and St. Paul were speaking, the religious life as we know it had not, had not yet been developed and wouldn't be for, for some hundreds of years. And that's important to keep in mind. So those who consecrated their, their virginity, um, also widows who abstained by free choice from a second marriage, those who may have had committed sins of unchastity, but afterwards repented and and from then on about themselves to celibacy, right? They, they all lived their lives more or less in the world. And, and then throughout history, even as religious life came into being, there have been those who, for whom religious life was not an option for, for whatever reason, or it didn't work out, or they found some special role for themselves serving God as, as single in the world. And the, the church is, yeah, you know, bless them and, and, uh, approve them and, and even raise some of them to the, the honor of the altars. So for example, St. Zita, is a 13th century Italian saint, patroness of domestic workers, single woman, housekeeper for, for years, for decades, for the same, uh, wealthy family. And she was also the, the nurse of their children. Um, you have, uh, Pauline, uh, Jericho, the, 18th century founder of the Society for the Propagation of the Faith, the Living Rosary Association, and other pious works. And she took a vow of chastity, but always lived in the world. She was also a spiritual daughter of uh, St. John Vianney. So if there had been something wrong with her way of life, we could rely on him to have let her know. Um, you have St. Benedict Joseph Rab, sometimes pronounced Labre, uh, who is a homeless man, wandered throughout, uh, throughout Europe. That's kind of un more or less perpetual pilgrimage, uh, had, had taken private vows of chastity, but uh, did not live in religious life. Um, and uh, in the 20th century, uh, Joseph Muscati, the holy doctor of Naples, who was a physician, he was a medical school professor, um, and interestingly, a, a pioneer researcher in, in, uh, in biochemistry. So he'd taken a vow of perfect chastity in order to better free him to 
to perform his his works of charity, right? For the for the sick, for the dying, for the poor. Um, really, a, a, a remarkable life, fruitful in good works. Died at the rather young age of forty seven, um, but having you know, left behind him a a great memory of sanctity and a great deal of uh, of accomplishment for uh, for God and for souls. Also, an, another interesting one, Saint Saint Nuno of uh, of Portugal, who uh, who was married, um, but after his his wife died, he did not remarry, and he did finally end his life. The last couple of years of his life, he was a Carmelite religious. But after the death of his wife and, and before entering religion, he did uh, vow to remain celibate, and he continued to be the, the supreme commander of the armies of Portugal. And he uh, never lost a battle. They were fighting wow. to maintain maintain their independence from from Spain during his uh, during his lifetime, and uh, he never once lost even a battle to the Spanish, keeping uh, keeping Portugal independent. All right, and that's just you know it's a few examples. Uh, but this way of life is is something well established in the history of the church. It's not it's not a novelty. Um, it's not an aberration. It's a, it's something that that has produced great fruit. So tremendous work for the church and for souls and and for society and for the country of Portugal, right? accomplished by those who have chose themselves to to uh, chose for themselves this consecration um, by celibacy in the world. So once again, an absolutely legitimate choice if someone wants to do that. Sure. That's fascinating. So someone who is, you know, not hindered by the the necessity of taking care of a family can, you know, their time is their own, but they're not using it in a selfish way. Like we talked about with the first category of people, they're right. using it for very good practical things that also help the church. Um, mm-hmm. That's fantastic. Definitely. Yeah. And I... Tons of, of, of pious and apostolic work depend on, on people in, in that condition. As I've mentioned, I think, in our, our podcast on marriage, that our, our schools, for example, and how many uh, single women have, have dedicated their lives to the education of the young, and uh, where would we be without them? Sure. Absolutely. So I guess some, some consequences of what we've been talking about, there's, you know, different ways of looking at it based on the different categories that we've been looking at. And we can give some advice or some, uh, some consolation, I guess, to each of these categories in turn. Right. So if one's staying single in the world simply for selfish reasons, he should make a better choice. Right? Either uh, enter consecrated life, get married, or dedicate himself to really consecrated single life, uh, doing something worthwhile. Uh, those hoping to get married... Again, should not lower their standards under a bad marriage just because years have passed without any promising candidates appearing. Right? Far better to be alone than to be irreversibly attached to a loser that you will have to try to drag to heaven. And once again, the choice of the single life as a permanent condition is, is legitimate. And even to, with the advice of a prudent spiritual director, to vow oneself to perpetual chastity in the world is definitely permissible and possible. Sure. When we're talking about, you know, again, the single life, whether it's a, a period of time, say after you're widowed or widow word, widowed, anyway, just say uh, widowed. or just say widowed. Thank you. Uh, or you're single, maybe younger in your twenties, something like that. Again, can, can we talk a little bit more about the way that you should be approaching uh, the single life there? It's, it's not just a time for travel and fun and, you know, racking up a big credit card bill. Right. And there can be some travel and fun. I would definitely recommend staying away from the big credit card bill, especially if you go into debt. Sure. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Which would, which prevents you from doing a lot, you know, would prevent your entry into the seminary or religious life, would cause you problems with marriage. Anyway. Um, yeah. This isn't a, you know, Dave Ramsey broadcast. So. <laughs> <laughs> Last one wasn't car talk. This one is <laughs> this Dave Ramsey. Right. Let's just stay away from those topics. Right. We'll stop plagiarizing <laughs> other people. Um, yeah. So whether one is is single uh, as a temporary condition or as a permanent condition, one should be seeking to serve God in in those circumstances. So yeah, as mentioned, single people, some of the our greatest helpers in the apostolate, not bound by family ties, having that that free time to dedicate to to the service of the church, to the service of souls. Uh, they have less need for for a large salary because they're not supporting anyone else. They may not have to spend as much time working. Uh, or may even be able to take a, you know, a, a job that doesn't pay terribly well, like teacher in a uh, small Catholic school. <laughs> um, and I would say every person who is single 
should have an apostolate or a work of Catholic action or the like in which he participates. Uh, and that, that I include in that those who are planning to get married, right? Even those who are, who are young in their late teens, early 20s, they're not in school anymore, but they shouldn't be just focused on, on having a time of amusement. It should be a time of generosity, which will be the, the best preparation for marriage or for dedicating oneself to the, the, the priesthood or religious life. Right? Because you're already starting to, to, to give of yourself, sacrificing your time, sacrificing your energy, uh, in, and not just for nothing, but for worthwhile causes, for things that can have long-term positive effects for, for the church, for, uh, for the salvation of souls. And I think it, it's, it is even more important, for, of course, for those who are, you know, find themselves in, in that, that state of being single for a long time or who choose to, to remain, remain single um, and to uh, avow themselves to, to celibacy. Um, because we all need something to dedicate ourselves to. You know, for, for priests and for religious, we have that, that taken care of. We're, we're dedicating our lives to the service of God in his church and our superiors tell us exactly how to go about accomplishing that before married people, right? They have, they have their families that they're, you know, is their primary apostolate, so to speak, to help their spouses and children to, um, to get to heaven. And, uh, and they have other, of course, associated activities, um, with, uh, that go along with, with being, um, married, having children, being involved in, in parishes and schools and, and so on. So, Single people don't have those things built into their lives. They've got to find it. And our life is, is not just for, you know, killing time, for making money, for having fun. It's to do worthwhile things. And that's at, at any stage of, uh, of our life. So I think that sure. it's, it's critically important if we want, you know, to find happiness, to find fulfillment, to find a uh, real purpose in, in the things that we do. We need to have, to have something substantial to dedicate ourselves to. And it's true that's of, great of every human being. It's a great point you made about uh, giving of yourself while you're single, because otherwise, then when you do choose either the consecrated life or marriage, it's going to be that much harder on you. Um, I remember, I mean, I got married relatively young, but I was living on my own for two, three years. Within, I think it was within the first couple of weeks I got married. I came home and I had already eaten, you know, Big Mac and fries. And my wife said, what's for dinner? Oh, I already ate. Oh, I need to think about someone else now too, Right. <laughs> that. Um, right. Right. And it didn't go over very well because I was being selfish. I was just thinking of me. Imagine if you had that state in life for 10 years and you were just amusing yourself and thinking about me. It's a lot harder than to transition into religious life or marriage. Right. I, and I think so. And I had you know a similar experience. I was at college and then living at home after that, but basically coming and going as I pleased. And I found the, the seminary really hard for the first few months mm -hmm. because I suddenly just couldn't do whatever I wanted. I, there was a, a bell right. sounding all the time. And I'm, right, what do I have to be now? <laughs> um, and it was, and that, that break put on what I perceived as, as my freedom was, uh, was very difficult at times. Whereas if I, if I had been more generous in those, those years prior, then perhaps it would have been a, an easier transition for me. Um, but yeah, it, it is, you know, you can develop all kinds of bad habits too, of, of just of, you know, of, of selfishness, of, of, of bachelor living that, that, uh, um, where it's, you know, just, just out for number one. And then when the situation cha changes, that can be, uh, can cause a lot of difficulties. Yeah. So, so bottom line, I, I guess, I guess what the, if we can distill it down to kind of one sentence, you're trying to just smash this idea that the single life is bad. Yes, definitely. Okay. Um, we just need to, to bury the idea forever. Right, that that your only choices are the priesthood or religious life or marriage, and if you're not doing one of those, there's something terribly wrong. And I won't flatter myself that this this podcast will, you know, destroy the this mistaken notion forever. Um, but we do have to keep in mind that the church has dogmatically defined that the state of virginity or of celibacy is superior to that of marriage. That's the Council of Trent, Session Twenty Four. If anyone saith that the married state is to be placed above the state of virginity or of celibacy, that it is not better and more blessed to remain in virginity or in celibacy than to be united in matrimony, let him be anathema. Okay. Uh, there's no direct reference in that um, definition to, to the priesthood or religious life. Just in general, 
virginity or celibacy. So, yeah, the, there's not an indication that you have to be in one of those states to remain single. And the church has canonized numerous people who have lived unmarried in the world, which would seem to indicate that it's okay. Right. So if you're one of those people who's been telling anyone that they that they have to get married because they're not religious or priests, then you are seriously, gravely wrong right? and in demonstrable opposition to the teaching of the church. So stop it right now. And if you said it to anyone, go back and tell them you were wrong. Right. Okay. And tell me how you really think. Father. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, it's, I mean, these, uh, oh, I get it. These ill-formed and mistaken notions, they, they do damage to souls. Yeah. And, you know, if anyone has, has entered into a, a, a bad marriage because of advice like that, that's on the person who gave the advice. Yeah. Whatever his state may be, priest, religious, or lay person in the world, if they're, you know, offering advice like that, that's, that's a serious problem. Right. And for, for those who are considering marriage, they, they need to keep their standards high, right? Don't, don't be afraid of, uh, of being single. Um, your goal is a solid, holy Catholic marriage, not just any marriage at all. And, um, and, you know, we have to remember too, that we can, we can sanctify ourselves in, um, pretty much any condition. Sometimes it's just life dealing us a particular hand and um, we have to play it. And there's always some, some degree of that. You know, we might, if for someone who converts late and thinks, well, it would have been great if I had, had entered a Catholic marriage or had been able to become a priest and, and they just, it's, it's uh, you know, that ship has sailed, they can still sanctify and save their souls. And, Absolutely. you know, we, there's this kind of underlying idea that I think we all have to a certain extent. Which is, if just if things were just different, right? if things if I could just just program how things go and 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 say if my life was like this, then I could be happy and holy and everything else that I need to be. Um, but that's not anybody's life, for one thing. That that everything goes the way we plan it, and it's it's God who's in control. And if He's allowed us to be in the situation, He wants us to to save our souls in that situation, right? Right here, right now, I can live for God whatever my particular condition is. And that should be my preoccupation. And if, if states, if choice of different states is still open to me, then I can choose. If not, then I, I, I work where I am and, uh, and do everything I can to, to follow our Lord Jesus Christ and to uh, do good work for, for the church and for souls. And then I have nothing, nothing I need to worry about. Yeah. Father, it's great advice. And I agree, hopefully this idea needs to, or this idea ends soon, <laughs> quickly, but die, dies a quick death. But yeah. we'll see. We can, we can hope. <laughs> we can hope. Father, thanks again. Looking forward to talking to you next time. My pleasure, Andrew. God bless you. You too. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode of the SSPX Podcast. You can find all our previous series and episodes on sspxpodcast.com. Also, don't forget to subscribe to and rate this podcast on whatever podcast app you use and on YouTube. This helps more people to discover the beauty and the truth of traditional Catholicism. And if you're able, we'd greatly appreciate your support of a one-time or a monthly recurring donation for these projects. All that information is at sspxpodcast.com. Until next time, thank you for listening and God bless you.